second and third year university students often don't have sufficient preparation or have not been through enough schooling to be qualified test engineers for a company like ours. However, the good side is they make excellent interns. So often our interns tend to be third year students in any of the engineering disciplines. So for example, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, obviously electrical engineering, computer science, computer hardware engineering, uh, also biomedical engineering, that's a popular subject these days as well. A third year student has enough book work, theoretical knowledge, that they can then apply to the practical work that we do of test engineering. Well, we all know about the email that the Google engineer wrote recently, and there's been a lot of pushback against that. Um, unfortunately, some of the reason for the dearth of engineering is historic prejudice, historic misogyny, which I think is very unfortunate because I do not believe at all that females lack or are deficient in innate ability compared to males like the Google engineer was trying to argue in his unfortunate email. I think people tend to hire people who look like them, unfortunately. And in engineering, historically, that has been white and Asian males. When I have a group of interns come through my office, when I have a group of these third year students come to my office, out of 10 students, typically no more than one or two of them are female. Um, I would like to see that change. I'm doing my part to see that it changes. I have hired female uh, interns. I have female employees. Two of the key people that help run my business are female, and I'm very proud of that. My wife is co-owner of our business. She makes all the big decisions with me. So we may be exceptional in that regard or kind of an outlier in that regard. I would hope that's going to change. I would hope that the Google letter would have the opposite effect, that it would motivate more companies to make more efforts to, to promote female talent where they have it and to encourage female talent to apply for work there, both as interns and as regular staff, whether it be engineers, accountants, administrators, human resources, whatever. We need more female talent. Miniaturization. Things are getting smaller and smaller. And when, when things get smaller and smaller, when printed circuit boards and electronic packaging miniaturizes, it becomes exponentially more difficult for testing. In the past, you had dedicated test points where you could attach a fixed probe to a test point on a board and run a signal through it to determine whether the board was assembled correctly. Nowadays, with cell phone boards, for example, they're so small, you don't have room, you don't have real estate left to design these dedicated test points. So you have to come up with or invent new testing techniques that are virtual testing techniques, utilizing software, utilizing antenna technology and other things in order to gain access to the board to determine that it's built correctly. Miniaturization drives the technological innovation in the testing business. So it's always one step ahead of what we do, but hopefully we rise to the challenge. Miniaturization and speed. Accomplishing more in a small confined space faster. Signal speeds, clock speeds much faster. Operating logic devices, microprocessors, microcontrollers, and FPGAs at high speed. RF frequency testing, where we're in the gigahertz range or the multiple gigahertz range. In-circuit testing, when it first was introduced 35, 40 years ago, operated at clock speeds in the megahertz, one to six megahertz range. Nowadays, you know, we're dealing with fiber optics and, and, and RF speeds in the, in the 10, 50, and 100 gig range. So the technology constantly is striving to adapt to those speeds and to all of that high speed technology being packaged in a very, very small space.
That's a never-ending challenge for us. We get computer-on-a-chip designs that are literally the size of a thumb thumbnail, and we're asked to test those. Sometimes you can't even electrically test them. You have to optically test them or use imaging technology, x-ray, CT scan, or some combination of that because of access limitations. Larger boards, while they are large, typically have more access available to them and in a, in a kind of counterintuitive way, sometimes they're easier to test. So the smaller a device becomes, as a general rule, the harder it is to test. Um, customers are always concerned with cost in the R&D phase because they know the design is going to go through multiple iterations before it's a production ready product. So there's an inbred hesitancy on the part of purchasing staff to spend more money than they need to on testing. We do have solutions to that. Things like boundary scan JTAG testing, things like flying probe testing, which can be done, which can be implemented very quickly, as opposed to fixed test probes and in-circuit testing, which take much longer to implement and cost a lot more. Um, you're talking a five-figure sum of money for an in-circuit test fixture and program versus maybe a few thousand dollars for a flying probe or a JTAG program that we can implement in most cases in less than a week. That's typically more suitable in an R&D environment where the customer knows they have to at least have some minimal level of shorts and opens testing and some minimal level of verifying that all the components are placed and oriented correctly. That's usually the most cost effective and best, fastest, most implementable solution at the NPI R&D level. Of course, some customers want to take the risk and they don't adopt testing at all, and then if it fails, they deal with it on the bench. We generally uh, uh, caution against that. That's very risky. Um, so the solution that I described, the Flying Probe JTAG solution, is often, in our experience, the, the best solution. Again, the one that I mentioned earlier, miniaturization is probably the biggest trend. Um, the other trend that we're seeing is a skepticism about overseas manufacturing. We've seen a lot of pullback from China. Not everybody is relying on China as their ultimate manufacturing solution anymore. Where maybe five, ten years ago, everybody wanted to go to China with every kind of product, every quantity. That is no longer the case. We're seeing a lot of that production go to Mexico, for example. We're seeing some of it actually come back here. Here being the United States, not necessarily Silicon Valley, but here somewhere in the States. Or a collaboration between here and Mexico. Maybe the R&D activity takes place here and the volume manufacturing is taking place in places like Mexico. So people are being more selective about where they locate their manufacturing and asking harder questions about the risk inherent in overseas manufacturing. And we, as an industry, I think, and as a geographical area, I think, are benefiting from some of those trends. At least I hope so. We've seen some evidence to that effect. We have some new services coming in the area of 3D imaging that we think are going to be very interesting not only to this industry, but to other industries as well, applying a business model that has been very successful for us in the last five years, non-destructive failure analysis of printed circuit board assemblies, broadening that and applying it to lots of other industries and doing it in the same NPI speed-driven business model where an engineer can bring us their product today and tomorrow will have an, an answer for them, a solution to their problem where they don't have to wait weeks for a lab to give an answer, come to us and tomorrow we'll, we'll be able to show you the root cause of your problem so you can take corrective action. There's a great value in that and we hope to drive that uh, very successfully in the coming years.